Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your moderator for the Tatra Summit brainstorming, Nick Gowing. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you who were here before lunch, I said this is going to be a brainstorming, and that's the spirit in which we want to continue this, and it's great that you're all here, and that uh, on a Saturday afternoon, uh, you haven't disappeared up on the Danube or up on the hill. So thank you very much indeed uh, for being here. Um, we are wanting to really work out what is going to happen in the European Union, ha-ha, um, in, the, in, the, in the future. You can define the future as a few days, a few months, a few years. You can decide for yourself it's merely a few hours. But it's an uncertain future, it's an unpredictable future. You can use whichever description that you want. Um, brainstorming from Bratislava, where we are, um, still in the European Union presidency, after the summit a few weeks ago, to Rome, where there's going to be a review uh, next March. So that is the challenge, and all of you will have ideas. And just before we get going, I want to remind you that this is a brainstorming. And I've said to uh, the four panelists that this is about you generating um, the uh, agenda and the thoughts of, of uh, what you want to say and what you want to hear, uh, because actually sometimes you have better ideas than a moderator does. And they've all asked me, what are we going to talk about? And I said, well, it's up to you. So um, within reason, uh, you can be the provocateurs. Then the panelists can complain about you rather than me asking difficult questions. So um, let me just underscore uh, who we've got. I want you to think, therefore, about uh, what, you're, what you want to ask. And I'm going to come to you one after the other very quickly before we get going. Um, first of all, we have uh, Daniela Schwarzer. Welcome. Uh, who is direct, she's currently a uh, German Marshall Fund uh, in Berlin. But it's a bit like uh, Kristalina Gorgieva yesterday. People arrive with one job and leave with another job. Um, <laughs> because from, tu from Tuesday, we don't, we, don't, we don't give people jobs in this room, but uh, she's going to be uh, head of the German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin. Uh, so that's to clarify uh, what she's doing. Uh, we have Ivan Kochok, who is uh, Minister Delegate for the Slovak Presidency um, of the Council of the European Union, State Secretary, Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs. And we have, from Tallinn, we have uh, Mati Masikas. Now, you'll see that on your card, uh, he's not listed, but he's uh, agreed to appear because, in fact, the representative from Italy couldn't make it and had to withdraw suddenly yesterday afternoon. So, Mati, thank you for dropping in. Uh, Deputy Minister for EU Affairs uh, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Estonia. Welcome. Uh, and finally, Zdenek Turek, who is Czech. Uh, he's chief executive of Citibank in Europe, lives in London, based in Dublin. Um, and <laughs> therefore, before we get going, because everyone will say, you moved there for tax reasons, didn't you? Uh, and he will say, no, that's not the case. But given that not many of you will know exactly everything there is to know about Citibank, uh, before I go um, to everyone here and ask their, for their ideas, Zdenik, why don't you just explain what you do in Ireland, put put to rest any idea that you're there for other reasons, but what has happened and why you've rebased towards Ireland? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have created a bank there since the beginning of this year called Citibank Europe PLC. And that bank, just to make no mistake, emerged through the merger of two entities, one in the UK, one in Ireland. It is passported to operate across 21 countries in Europe, where we have our branches with about 9,000 people. And it's the bank that will be under ECB supervision soon. So we have created a subject which is a legal subject that is operating across the continent. So and why Dublin? Well, we have 52 years, 51 years of history in Dublin. And uh, we have a major service center and product center there with about 2,500 people. So and Ireland is the largest of the 21 countries where the bank operates. Very simple. And how many other bases have you got, um, processing bases and the kind of thing you're doing in Dublin elsewhere in Europe? We have two other big service centers in Europe, one in Poland, one in Budapest, in Hungary. And then uh, the other branches are purely for the corporate customer business. All right, thank you very much. Now, let me tell you, uh, for those of you who still have the app, 
please use that. It's a great way of communicating with me so I can get as many ideas in the next uh, hour and 25 minutes from you. And also, for those who are watching online somewhere around the world, uh, you too uh, can join us by uh, pressing that button uh, on the app, uh, which is very clear. Um, and you can do it by the website as well. And also, uh, there is the hashtag uh, GTS16. It's a great way of me knowing what's on your mind before I come to you, and I might use whatever you send me as a, as a catalyst uh, to explain um, what you may, may want to raise, and then I know the kind of areas you want to talk about. I'm going to come to you uh, all in a moment, but for those of you who weren't here yesterday, let me just remind you what Wolfgang Schäuble, sitting there yesterday, said uh, right at the beginning of his uh, remarks. Uh, he talked about most of my time not building the House of Europe, but repairing it. And that was very much the spirit of the discussion which happened this time yesterday, including what is the value of rules in the European Union, and really that sense of uh, which way are things going to go uh, from uh, now on. How do the skeptics about the European Union get confounded uh, in his words? And we heard from the Commissioner as well, uh, Moscovici, that um, there's a, now a new challenge across Europe which is democratic accountability in every single country, not just because of Brexit, but we've seen it in Hungary, we're going to see it in Italy, we're seeing it in so many places. Um, and the Italian uh, foreign minister, uh, we have to improve the rules and deepen political um, uh, uncertainty is now creating damage to the European Union. Uh, Mr. Schäuble did, though, pay spirit to the spirit, he, he paid tribute to what he called the spirit of cooperation from the Bratislava summit. But could it be that actually many at the Bratislava summit were ignoring some of these fundamental problems in ways which many of you, I'm sure, will want to raise? But there was this focus um, uh, on relating to the people. Uh, and as Mr. Sapin said from France, he said, people simply do not understand much of what we're doing. And we heard from Mr. Muscovici that even he sometimes doesn't understand the bits of paper that are put in front of him, um, even at a press conference. So these are very significant existential challenges for the European Union. And the final thing for those of you who weren't here yesterday, uh, it was a direct question about whether there's going to be a recession in 2017. Uh, Mr. Moscovici said there will be no recession in 2017. Uh, growth will continue. Growth will be going on, as he put it. But um, from Italy, this sense that there are downside risks, forecast, there is a danger, to quote him, of muddling through. So uncertainty, unpredictability, muddling through, that's the kind of spirit which we now have to address. So get the microphones ready. Let me ask you to help create the agenda in this session. No long speeches, maximum of 30 seconds. Who'd like to come in? I can take three or four. Who'd like to come in? Or do you have no questions at all? Do you have no issues? You're all <laughs> comfortable about the future? Shall we go and have a coffee, please? <laughs> uh, Martin L. from Czech Economic Daily. I have uh, not question, one word, referendum. Say again, sorry. A referendum as a tool uh, for deciding future of the Europe. Can everyone, should there be a referendum? A referendum. What, a referendum in every an, country? Any, any referendum in any country, what we are expecting in the uh, future of the, of the EU. All right, because we already had some referendums this year. Okay, boy. Anyone else coming in, please? Uh, put your hands up, then we can get the Matt Breiser over there um, and the lady in front in a moment. Who else, please? Don't sit on your hands. Matt, Thanks, welcome. Dave. Nice to see you. Thanks. Nice to see you, too, always. Uh, common foreign policy. This criticism could be for the U.S. as well, but uh, Minister Schäuble also said yesterday that when the EU talks about dealing with Syria, it doesn't have a plan. It criticizes the U.S. for mistakes, Russia for bad uh, actions. Common values, what, what are we going to do together about Russia bombing children and civil, other civilians without the council even being able to take a decision to issue a warning in the last statement that perhaps there could be additional sanctions on Russia? Because Schäuble said yesterday, we, we act with a stronger voice if we all act together. Yeah. Okay, the lady in front, please, uh, who else? Thank you. Um, I'm Kate Chichawa. I'm from Georgia, an information center in NATO and EU. 
Well, um, we have been hearing a lot about EU, and I'm thinking we're going to hear more on this session. But, you know, it would be interesting to hear uh, what would be the future also on the side of the neighborhood policy, how you see the strengthening of the partnership, or what could be the future for countries like us, who is very much interested to be, you know, even stronger partners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else, please? I can't believe all of you come here not to speak. Martin Michelo, Europeum in Prague. Uh, one very Quick question. Uh, in a majority of the EU countries, the youth chooses not to vote. The simple question is, how can we ensure that the youth is part of the political process? How can we ensure that the youth is part of the decisions that are being made towards future? The British referendum is a striking example of the youth not voting to take part in its future. I think this is your message that I've got here. There's a wonderful phrase. It's now been taken away, so if you could put it back. I think it, you used a phrase like majority abs abstentionist or something like that. Uh, that's New English to me, if I may say. Um, <laughs> majoritarily abstentionist. So let's, let's, in a non-EU way, make sure that everyone understands what you're talking about. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to come in, please? Now the hands are going up, so I'm going to put a limit of five minutes on this. Get, grab a microphone and then... Hi, nice to Hi. see you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the question is, how does the EU deal uh, in the coming days, months, and years with the democratic regression in its member states? Will it simply be paying lip service and raising formal uh, queries, or is there more to come? Democratic abstentionism, more to come. Uh, who's got the microphone next, yeah. please? Uh, Franz Nauschnig, Austrian Central Bank. Uh, more uh, infrastructure investment, uh, helping uh, growth and uh, connecting Europe better. Better growth as well, please. Uh, Eugeni Prekerman, <laughs> Belarus, Minsk Dialog Truck 2 Initiative. Also, Eastern Neighborhood. Uh, how are relations with the countries that are part of both the Eastern Partnership and the Eurasian Economic Union are going to develop in, in the years to come? Thank you very much indeed. That's building on the Georgia question. The gentleman at the back. I can't see everybody, please. Ivan Kuhn, Conservative Institute. Is ever closer union still the future of the Europe? Say again, please. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Is ever closer union still the future of the Europe? All right, thank you. The gentleman there, please. John Foster, uh, University of Oslo. I'd like you to reflect on the, ice, on the notion of crisis. It's, it's been said that the EU normally builds and develops through crisis. Um, are all the challenges we're seeing now real crisis? Because a crisis is a fundamental aspect. Are some of them actually more matters of lack of political will or policy and institutional aspects? So can we differentiate between what are fundamental crises and also will the EU grow through this crisis? Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> the lady at the front, anyone else? Please, any other hands going up? We've now uh, got a full agenda, it, please, um, go ahead. Uh, how do you solve the Eurozone crisis? <laughs> oh. uh, how you do were you get asking beyond... that last year, weren't you? Uh, indeed. How do you get beyond the governing by rules and ruling by numbers? How would you define the Eurozone crisis now? Uh, still bubbling beneath the surface, mm, totally. mm. given all the other crises that we're not seeing. Uh, all right. Uh, Anyone else? One more, please. The lady here. And then I'm going to sort of start asking. Thank you. you. Hannah Schellis, Ukraine Analytica. EU global strategy, was it necessary? And is EU really a global player uh, that can develop according to the strategy presented in June? Thank you very much indeed. Good. That doesn't stop you sending messages or putting up your hand at any point, but I wanted to find out the kind of things which are on your mind. Obviously, some of you have vested interests, but uh, there are very important trends here, I think, panel, for the kind of areas uh, to pick up. Let's pick up this issue first on demo uh, demographic abstentionism and also a democracy. And there's another question here from Yeri Schneider on the same uh, lines at, from the Aspen Institute in Prague. How to transform the current populist move moment in Europe into greater democratic accountability. In short, turn populi into demos, into demos demos. I think it says demos there. Um, but you, you see the, the gist of this, how, um, how public accountability is going to be embraced at the speed that the public is becoming disenchanted. Minister, let me come to you first, Ivan Kochok. <clears throat> Thank you for that, uh, for that question. Uh, I think it's obvious that no one of us is prepared to answer that question <laughs> because this is a 
uh, Nick, very innovative way of uh, running this, this panel. I'm not, not against it, of course. <laughs> but um, I believe... But I would be asking that question even if I wasn't asking yeah, the audience. That's, that's, that's <laughs> all right. That's all right. No, how to, how to improve democratic legitimacy and abstentionism. I think I'll focus on European Union. I believe our malaise in European Union, which is creating problems and allowing, um, allowing the populists mobilize against European Union is, is our complacency, is our an inability in European Union to deliver on what we have agreed. And unfortunately, over the last 10 to 12 years, and Minister Schäuble spoke about longer period because he said that he spent almost his uh, entire life uh, rather repairing European Union than, than building it in up. But I think at least in, in last 10 years, the citizens in, in European Union have got a picture of European Union where they were not convinced of EU's ability to resolve crisis. And I, I, I refer at least to the Euro crisis, then definitely uh, migration, then we stood confronted with the, with the Russian aggression and we were not able, Russian aggression against Ukraine, we were not able to prevent it. And I think one of the problems, without you know, any expectation that I can cover the, the issue entirely, but I believe this is our inability to deliver, first of all, our complacency very often uh, we, we are rather pushing and, and snowballing the problems ahead of us than we are tackling and, and resolving them. So there should be no wonder that the European Union is, has, been producing, uh, has been producing this picture. What can we do about it? I think we can go into details of what should be done. For example, to complete the business with, uh, with Eurozone because it's incomplete and I agree with your description. It's rather <laughs> under the surface. It's not, not over. Yet, and if you go through the, the items uh, that are on the table, I believe that, that my point is valid with uh, our, our complacency. And that is, once again, offering uh, the mobilizing effects for, for populists, because populists, we know that they, do not they are not resolving problems, they are creating them. Daniela, can I come to you, um, given what's going to happen in Germany uh, in September next year? Um, but the, the, the phrase used there was, demographic ab abstentionism, is there more to come? And we can describe it in very different ways. And we saw what happened in Hungary, 98% agreeing on the referendum, but many people didn't vote. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what's your assessment uh, as you move from one institution to another? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Nick. So, first of all, let me say that much of what we see in terms of a lack of democratic legitimacy or the questioning of democracy as we've seen it blow, grow and flourish in, in post-war Europe is not a problem that is solely linked to the European Union, but often we look at it through that lens. So we look at EU criticism and problems with democracy at the same time. Yet I'd like to concede that, of course, because of the deficiencies of the structure of the European Union, in particular in the Eurozone, this has created a situation that in some member states has actually strengthened that feeling that elections don't matter anymore, that you can't actually influence your own fate. The European level isn't democratic enough and national democracy cannot change enough anymore under the conditions of a single currency and no true European economy, uh, economic policy. So I would say deficiencies in the architecture of Europe actually strengthen the problems on the national level. Now, what, what we have seen as, a, as the new political context in Europe, but again, not solely in Europe, look at the United States is an increasing degree of political polarization, of short-term policy making, um, the idea that direct democracy brings better solutions. And in, in my perspective, the situation in the European Union where a referendum in one country can take the others hostage and not moving ahead or actually questioning a policy is definitely not sustainable. So but let me be clear, for all four of you, do you think that the penny has dropped or the, son, the cent has dropped? about the scale of public backlash? I wouldn't say we are there, no. But we need you mean to they're in denial still? Well, well, no. I mean, I think, first of all, moderate or centrist policymakers who are pro-European are keenly aware of the problem, but they are afraid to actually speak up for the European Union in the way they need to. 
And what does that mean? It, 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 need, it means reminding citizens what Europe has actually brought to us. We are caught in a very negative discourse where um, pro-European policymakers are on the defensive because right and left-wing movements that are EU critical actually grow. And the point here is really important to differentiate between anti-European and EU critical. I think we all need to be EU critical because the system needs to be improved, but that doesn't mean you are anti-European. All right. Well, look, let's keep the answers reasonably short. Ivan, can I come to back to you and just ask, do you think after the Bratislava summit and with the, with the EU presidency, you detect that the, the, the realization is there, or is there a kind of blind denial in the kind that we've just heard from Daniela? The, no, I think... Uh, all who are in European business recognize the serious situation in which we are. In Bratislava, by the way, the, the most important part of the debate was not spent on the roadmap for Bratislava. It was not spent on declaration from, uh, on, from Bratislava. It was, a, it was a discussion and exchange of view of diagnosis where we are. So I don't think that, that someone in European Union would uh, underestimate how serious situation there is in European Union. And I, I would like to shed a bit of optimism in, in there, because out of this, I dare say, cropping up of, of, of consensus uh, over d diagnosis, I believe we can take some action to, to do the remedy to European which Union. Which answers that question over there about how to turn a crisis into something which is an mm -hmm. evolution. All right, thank you, Matty. Um, thank you for being patient. But what's your assessment um, from the Baltics? Uh, for me, uh, the key phrase in the Bratislava Declaration was, was the one uh, the, where the leaders pledged to bring more clarity in our decisions. And, and that usually when politicians say things like that, they mean they need to better communicate what they are thinking and what, what they are doing. I think, I think uh, in, in the situation that we find ourselves in Europe right now, more needs to be done. Uh, uh, the political leaders uh, and political elites in all member states need to need to go out and make and engage with the public uh, in a quite different way. They, they will have to dare to make the positive case uh, for Europe. And as one wise think tanker uh, recently told, uh, they need to they need to make the positive case for the European interdependence. Do you believe that case is winnable among skeptics in increasing number? Yes, absolutely. Uh, because otherwise, uh, what we uh, traditionally how we approach this, uh, uh, this thing is look at, the, uh, look at the European Council conclusions from this October on trade, uh, the, where, where the trade uh, um, agreements that are under consideration or under, under negotiation, CETA, no, no, uh, signed uh, TTIP uh, and Japan. Uh, this part, uh, we tried, the leaders tried to balance with long list of, uh, of balancing measures, uh, saying what we are doing is right, uh, but then uh, don't worry, citizens, there are these, 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 these things. It's not that bad. I think it's not, uh, it's not enough anymore. You need to go out and make the positive case of we all benefit from trade, and this is why we and this, uh, and this is why we are doing this. Is there a danger though that the train has left the station and the, the, the train of skepticism has got far more momentum than the politicians can counter at the moment? No, uh, definitely not. And the uh, the overall support for the EU, uh, especially after the the, uh, the changes after the Brexit vote. Or encouraging. All right, Zdenek, let me come to you. You have the luxury of being uh, away from the political scene, but you've got to make some very difficult commercial judgments. And you were telling me that uh, in the nine months before the Brexit vote, probably unlike many other organizations, you had been scoping and red teaming what might happen if, and it was an uncomfortable experience. But as you listen to, to, to this, you have a risk department, yep. you have those who look at risk, <laughs> and often have to look at very difficult options. Do you think that this future is uncertain and going to get more uncertain from the commercial point of view? Well, listen, the businesses are very nervous, of course. I mean, there are some big principal answers that are still awaiting. And the Brexit was a bad surprise to, to most of us. 
So the risk management departments are very busy preparing for the potential breakup of passporting and all the common market. Are they right? making worst case assumptions then? And everybody the is still looking at the worst case because there is no read from the politicians about what is going to happen. So everybody has to, the way nine months before Brexit, where nobody believed in Brexit, we had to take the assumption that it might happen and prepare mm. for it. Today, I think I can speak at least for banks. In every bank, you have of size, you have a department looking at what might happen if there is a complete loss of passporting and what, does, what are the consequences. I but share with us, can you, what you think the worst case scenario is. The word on the title of this panel is uncertain. But you have to look at the bleakest possible scenario. I think if it comes to the worst case scenario, there is issue of timing, first and foremost, because the two years after Article 50 is not enough. You will need, you better have a transition period, at least in our industry, for implementation <coughs> of whatever will be the new agreement. There is a serious danger of so-called cliff effect. That there will be something which is gone and the new one will not be in place yet. That's point number one. And then you have the other ongoing consequences because the, you can find the solutions in case there is a complete breakup of the banking union in our case. But it will be more expensive for clients, more expensive for banks, and it will be more cumbersome by, by any comparison. So yes, we are worried and we are working on what the solutions could be. All right, so we have the politicians who have to manage this and you have to look pragmatically at what the options are and what may happen if things cannot move in a relatively well calibrated way and we can only guess about that at the moment. Let me give you an idea of can some I, of the ideas which one, are... one, one comment there is, there is a lot <laughs> of talk about hard Brexit and soft mm. Brexit. I think the, the real issue to the businesses is orderly Brexit mm -hmm. or disorderly Brexit. Is it going to be a planned and well-managed process? Or are we driven to the corner and forced to take our own decisions because there is no leadership and no clear concept and decision making? But that, that's thing. why we have to raise the question about the Italian referendum. We have to raise the question about what's going to happen in the Netherlands, what's going to happen in France, what's going to happen in Germany, because much of that what, yes. what happens there will influence the answer to the question. Now, uh, Daniela, uh, I have a, a bridging question for you because one comes from the German Marshall Fund, where you're working at the moment. The next one comes from the Council on Foreign Relations. So clearly you're, you're managing this very well. Even Weyverda, um, how will the EU deal with regression of democracy in its member states? Will it simply pay lip service to upholding the rule of law, checks and balance, or move more audaciously to defend liberal democracy, and it's a question for all of you. And on a scale from minus five to plus five, zero being the present situation, will there be more or less integration in Europe? From Jana Puglierin. <laughs> now, Daniela, this is a very simple question, series of questions, so what, what's, your, what's your answer? You've got the luxury of being able to sit in Berlin and just monitor it all. Yes, well, first of all, thanks, colleagues. Um, great. Um, <laughs> So, uh, the first one, is the EU only paying lip service? I think right now, yes, um, and that's a problem, because obviously there's a huge degree of helplessness looking at developments in Hungary, looking at developments in, uh, in Poland. And again, we need to differentiate at of what we're looking at. Are we looking at parties that have non-democratic claims in their platforms, or are we actually looking at constitutional change in a number of member states that really makes the situation in the future incompatible with the basic norms of the European Union they joined upon? And here, I think um, policymakers who abide by those norms need to be far more explicit and far more political. And the fact, for instance, that the European People's Party hasn't spoken out on the issue to the extent I would have wished for is just one example to say more has to happen. Now, um, the second question... Uh, on a scale from yeah. minus five to so plus five. <sighs> In five years now, I would say in some parts there will be more integration and that opens a whole new issue, which is I don't think that the European Union 28 minus one will move ahead in a, in a homogenous way. Um, we have a deeply integrated core, which is the Eurozone, and I think either the Eurozone integrates further or it may fall apart. Um, so I am still hopeful that this will happen, which is why I think at least for the core of the European Union, there will be more integration, and then there will be more flexible ways of associating others, and two hopes attached to that. First of all, 
that this whole process is managed in a way that differentiation doesn't lead to disintegration. There's a huge risk that this actually happens. And the second point is that if it is going to happen in a good way, that it is actually used to think about neighborhood policy and enlargement policy in a, in a better way as well, because if we get more flexible with the countries within the EU, this opens definitely um, ways of associating members who are not yet full members of the European Union. Because the question over there, which is which we're moving towards, but perhaps a bit faster than we expected, is ever closer union still on? Even Kochok. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come back to. Do you want me to remind you what they are? Yeah, uh, I, 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 I think I remember that. <laughs> yeah. The question the number one was. Yeah. How will the EU deal with yeah. regression of democracy yeah. in its member states? And on a scale of minus five to plus five. Um, will there be more or less integration in Europe? On, on, the, on the first one, let me be very open, we don't have consensus on it in, in European Union, whether that should be, I mean, the, whether the EU should, uh, should be the one in charge of, of ensuring uh, the rule of law and, and democracy in the, in the member states. No doubt that the commitment to basic rules and rule of law is one of the fundamental principles any country is committed to which wants to become a member of European Union. But uh, currently, everyone who is uh, following European affairs knows that there is an attempt within the European Union that EU should have more scrutiny when it comes to assessing the level of rule of law and respect of it in, in the member states. We don't have a consensus on it um, in, in European Union, and discussion is ongoing also in, in the context of uh, the developments in, in, in Poland. During Slovak presidency, we will make an assessment and carry out an assessment of the so-called rule of law dialogue uh, that, uh, that we are uh, having right now. But th this is a very good question. My, my opinion is that uh, it, it is the competence of member states uh, and, the, and the leadership uh, in, the, in the member states to ensure that countries which are members of European Union, they adhere to, to rule of law and uh, basic, uh, basic uh, values. And second, zero to five, this is impossible. It's minus five to plus five. Minus five, zero. whatever, whatever. I, I'm not buying that, you know, the, the scale. <clears throat> because you, you cannot answer it uh, that way. In some areas, I think we inevitably will need more integration. And therefore, when we start the reflection of future of European Union, we should uh, avoid uh, being dragged into traditional schema of discussing the future, namely between the two camps. One is shouting and calling for more Europe, the other one for less Europe. This is a mantra which I don't think can lead us somewhere. People do not understand it at all. I believe selectively we need more integration in some, some areas, like security, uh, for example. You cannot explain to your citizens that today member states are not able to, to share and exchange information in, in order to protect lives of their own citizens. We need it, more Europe. Let me put here. it to you that the nationalists and the populists who are gaining so much momentum in so many parts of Europe are saying that's not an I mean, we'll the, the benchmark will not be for me just to look what the, what the populists are all the time uh, claiming and, and telling because that will lead you nowhere. I mean, you have to have your concept, you have to believe in your, in your values and you have to act. And here, I think the complacency will be very uh, expensive for us in the area of, of economic and monetary union, where we need more integration. We constantly, we've been telling from the very beginning that, e, that monetary union cannot work without being fiscal union as well. But since the crisis, since we managed at least the, 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 the crisis um, and we have prevented it, the Eurozone from, from collapse, we are not making further steps, and I'm just waiting for the markets that will be driving us again. Uh, uh, you know, and, and this is the, the, the problem that if one is searching for an answer, whether there will be more integration or less, it will, I, can, I cannot give you an answer, but selectively I think we will have to look at the areas where we need it, where we need it more. If someone wants to see more Europe by transferring more competence, on European level at large, that will not work. If somebody believes that, that there will be more Europe when European Parliament is even more powerful, it will not work. But it will not work either unless we do more when it comes to internal security, when we complete the business with, with Eurozone. I hope I'm not misquoting him, but the impression left by certainly by Wolfgang Schäuble was we need to keep pushing mm -hmm. harder in order to integrate to make the European Union stronger. And I'm but, but, but Nick, he said, but he said at the same time that he knows it will be very difficult, and unless we are there, we need to stick to the rules that we have. Yeah. 
Uh, Matty, um, let me just pick up, can you pick up on the minus five to plus five and the other part of the question as well? But that question as well, complacency will be very expensive. Does that mean humility has a role among politicians? Not sure. Uh, mm. No, no, no. Uh, on, the, uh, on the more or less integration part, um, I'm putting the mark on uh, plus two. Um, there are practical things that we are doing, uh, practical things uh, and areas where, where we are deepening the integration. Take, take as maybe the biggest example, uh, take the banking union, mm. which um, when, when, the, when the discussion started uh, in, the, in the Council of the EU, one um, colleague with a long background in treasury uh, told me it will tell uh, it will it will uh, it will take you uh, 20 years to build the banking union uh, we have moved the eu has moved much much quicker than that there are areas uh, say in the in the single market in the digital single market where further integration is not only not only necessary but also possible quite quite feasibly so I'm, uh, I'm still fairly optimistic on the, on the fur further integration. Uh, Zdenek, uh, you have to make those commercial judgments. Um, what would you like to see and what do you think is likely? I mean, here we have complacency will be very expensive. Well, first on uh, some of the projects, including banking union, I mean, there is still work to be completed. I mean, do you believe it's moving in that direction? Uh, the guarantee fund is the big decision that is still to be taken and that's very important for that union to be comprehensive. But I think, I, you know, in the broader sense, of course the businesses, the business community would like to see the integration to continue. And with that greater discipline, especially when it comes to the, to the budgetary and overall reforms like the labor reforms, etc., in the union, because this would make Union much more competitive vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world, and that's the name of the game, really, in 21st century. But I think the broader sense, just to li listening to my colleagues here from the political sector, uh, coming back to Mr. Schäuble's parallel yesterday with that house that we are building, it seems to me that we are now realizing that ultimately we'll have to move and live in that house, give up our little houses where we where we are today, with some inconvenience, meaning uh, mm -hmm. the sovereignty will be restricted further. And I think there is not strong enough case and leadership for the advantages of doing that. And that's coming across the economy and politics and all the spectres of the society. It Where do you see the limitations in your mind as a chief executive of a major bank? What, what are the constraints that you're seeing when it comes to complacency being very expensive? Listen, the, the key constraint is Europe needs to be competitive in the industries that are industries of the future. And for that you need, first and foremost, macroeconomic and political stability. And I think a lot has been done in the direction, but some work is still to be completed. Then very competitive, very flexible labor force, and that's very patchy. We have seen countries like Spain doing something in the positive directions, but we are also seeing countries that are doing nothing. And last but not least, there must be a clear understanding about the priorities and where the money is going. I mean, the budget is finite, even for the European Union. And uh, we are seeing lots of initiatives and various funds reigning as ideas. But there must be a clear kind of policy in, in the sense that we picked our choices, we picked our battles, and that's where we want to win. All right, so right. quickly, between minus five and plus five, do you have a number in your mind? I think... Uh, my personal number would be four to five, but I think most of the businesses are thinking more in the middle, a muddling through zero. scenario. Zero. Yeah, zero, minus one, plus one. Mm. It's heavily compromised today. It's, you know, I, I, I do understand that not everything can be done at the same time, but uh, the, the, the decisions taken under pressure and in the crisis, within the crisis situations, is what we are seeing today, and that is not enough. All right, I'm, I'm methodically going through many of the areas you're, you're, you've raised, so don't um, get impatient. Bear with me. There's a limited amount of, 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 of air time here, but I'm moving in the direction of the questions that many of you have asked. But that particular question there about referendums, um, we've got one coming up in Italy. 
on a constitutional issue. It is very tempting, and uh, even in Britain now, after the decision on the Heathrow runway, the third runway, uh, there's now going to be a referendum almost in a constituency where the MP has resigned. That is now being seen as a referendum on Brexit, not about Heathrow. So I'm merely asking to say it's all very well asking that question about referendums. That's what the public seem to want. Is there a danger that referendums and a whole string of them are going to derail the project even more? Daniela. Well, first of all, I'm not sure that referendums are always what the public wants, but it's definitely something that actors use if they want to obstruct something or create more political polarization. Um, I think you have to be very careful for which questions and in which conditions you use referenda. To me, it looks like the European Union is not in a place where European questions can be put to referenda simply because we don't have the tools to hold truly European referenda. The situation we have seen in a number of member states, go back to France and the Netherlands, um, take the Dutch referendum on uh, Ukraine, that in a very specific national context, in a referendum situation, a decision is taken that creates a huge problem for the European Union as a whole. So my take on this is, if you want to argue for referenda for real European questions, there needs to be a European way to do this. But I don't think that at this point, the political system and the European citizens um, are there yet. So I would put the focus on a very different question, and that is how can I, and, or how can we enable citizens to actually understand their European responsibility and their ways of political participation in a much better way? Because the problem we face currently, that's the disconnect between the citizens and the system, you won't solve through referenda. It has implications for the involvement of civil society, for the way parties function in the European context, for the way um, institutions and policymakers actually open up and listen and bring in voices that are not usually heard, and that's for me the much more salient question. And once we have that in place, we can look at referenda as a tool. Mati Matsikas uh, from Estonia, you vote digitally, um, which is you're the only country that does it fully. Um, what, what is your reflection about people being able to sit in front of the television and just press a button on a referendum? Mm. Yeah. It's a very, uh, very and I'm cheapening the, the point. Um, <laughs> cheapening is, is never the point in, in, in democracy, really. Uh, Online uh, polling is, is a very good way. Uh, I mean, um, to get the uh, to get the temperature on, on various things. Uh, in uh, in my country, however, the constitution uh, forbids uh, referenda on international agreements and on budget. And I think it's quite uh, so. You couldn't do quite, a quite wise. No, that we couldn't. Do. Because obviously, there's a critical issue here. Referendums are to give the public a view, but actually the public in, 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 in elections vote for politicians to represent them. True. So there's something growing here. Um, uh, Ivan Kotrov. Uh, frankly, I'm not sure whether it makes sense to discuss referendums in a European context, because we can discuss it endlessly. At the end of the day, if there is a, a, a in, in a country, a specific country, um, the, Majority in favor of, of referendum, referendum will take place. Full stop. This is not this is not something that European Union on European lo Union we can regulate. Or, but do you or think whatever. it's good for politics? But that, that, that's the other question. But discussing European European issues and, and dwelling on whether referendums are a problem or not, we can do it, but we will ne not resolve it. But I'd like to remind us of. The fact that, if I remember correctly, since 2003, I believe, all referendums that were about European, European issues in, in the respective member states, at the end of the day, the outcome of it was against Europe. It all started with France and constitutional treaty in Netherlands and constitutional treaty, and it can continue like that. Recently in Netherlands about uh, about uh, free trade agreement with uh, Ukraine, and you can continue like that, because we know that rarely in a referendum people are responding to the question, which is the subject of referendum, much more they are giving an assessment to the, to the incumbent uh, government. And that, that I, I don't think that, that referenda can resolve it. I, I fully agree with Daniela. European issues as such, they are resolving issues in that respective country. Zdenek, uh, does business like referendums? 
to banks like referendums? Well, we surely could not run the banks on referendums. I can tell you that. What about if there were referendums about banks? <laughs> well, the issue, Nick, is I think the first is the scope of information pe people have. Look at Brexit and what people were really were voting about, right? So business is very nervous about the referendums because it means that the politicians do not have control of the situation. And they are referring it for various reasons to, to the public. Now, there at least you wish that the public has good information in the scope of the referendum to de decide correctly. It's not always, always the case. So I, I can't speak for businesses but I think in banking, there is a great level of nervosity about the increasing number of referendums. Yeah. Uh, Ivan Kochok. No, I, I, I just went, when I heard, heard us all laugh over your question whether there the, the could be referendum on banks, can we exclude it? I mean, in, mm -hmm. uh, today we are laughing. Do you want but, to have but, a referendum? But, but today in, should we have a referendum in here about whether we should have a referendum on banks? Here in this country? <laughs> no, I think we, no, we, we could have a referendum. There was, in this country, I'm quite relaxed because there was only one referendum valid, and that was mm -hmm. you know, on our accession to the European Union. So, but that, that's theory. But politically, I think, I'm, I'm concerned that, that anything is possible here, I mean, in the European <laughs> Union. If, mm. if somebody is able to mobilize to that level, that, that, that you target the banks, and remember that banks were labeled as the ones who are the, the, the reason and the perpetrators of all the evil and all the suffering of people across the European Union. In Greece, would you, ex would, you, would you exclude that? So today we are laughing, but be careful because be careful about what you're dreaming because it may, may come true. Yeah, but so then the I, would, I would reciprocate. I would ask for a referendum about do people want to have I'm, I'm, political I'm, parties. I hope, I, I, I hope I'm not min misunderstood <laughs> that I'm advocating having it. I'm just referring to the context that we are having in European Union. If you put something on the table, I, I'll give you one example. It is fascinating to me to hear, I, I simplify from Brussels bubble, that the problem with CETA, with the Canada-EU uh, free trade agreement was that it was not EU only and therefore that the parliaments were asked uh, and, and therefore the, the problem started. I dare say it, if that had not been case, I'm absolutely sure that somebody would mobilize for a referendum on it. So that was the only way how to ask the parliament, very difficult. Finally we got it yesterday, today it will be, uh, tomorrow it will be signed. But had that not been the case, I'm absolutely sure that the populists would mobilize against CETA future, in the future against TTIP, and we could have referendums on it. All right, let's move on. Um, uh, I think there's a consensus on the panel, certainly, that referendums are not a good idea, certainly too often, but I'm not going to have a referendum on that. Let's, uh, let's go to a couple more questions, please. Uh, and one of them is building on what you've just said, Ivan Kochok, about uh, and what uh, we've just heard from Matty as well about, uh, about uh, TTIP and uh, trade deals. Let's go to the f second one first. The reason CETA almost failed and TTIP is in danger is because people do not see how trade deals benefit them personally. They think trade deals only benefit big businesses. Do the panelists think this is a problem? In other words, has Wallonia, the parliament there, really been a, a yet another, even starker wake-up call, although it's now settled? And I'll come back to the, second, the first question in a moment because it distracts from that other important one, which is about benefiting big business. And after all, that is at the heart very much of the support for Trump in the United States. The big business is seen to have benefited from um, global deals. What's your view, um, Matty, about, uh, about CETA and TTIP and what, what must be expected of the public for them to understand that there are good things about deals as opposed to those who are suffering because they appear to think that their jobs have been threatened or removed because of these deals? I don't think it's, it's as simple as big businesses and, and the people. But, it's, but that's the way the people but, see it. But, it, but, uh, but it's clearly um, uh, about the winners uh, of globalization and those who uh, perceive themselves as the losers from the globalizations. Th th that's, that's in the, uh, for me, that's the, the, very, the very heart of... Uh, but for you as a politician, has this been a real wake-up call now? The developments around those uh, several trade uh, deals uh, for, for two last years, maybe, yes. yes. Not, not that much this Wallonian, this Wallonian parliament's uh, issue. 
uh, not, not that particular one, but that had more to do with the, with the EU's uh, decision making and everything. But but uh, this whole um, there there are people who have made uh, resistance to these trade deals their religion, and and it's um, it's been it, it's been sort of uh, obvious for for the last couple of years. Daniela. So I agree with the aspect they're winners and losers and what I guess the EU um, but also other regions or countries have neglected over the past years is that idea if you strike a trade deal you need to some, in some way compensate the losers. Actually the whole integration project in Europe has worked that way. That's why we're stuck with some quite expensive policies like the common agricultural policy. But the way this worked was every time there was more liberalism, there was some compensation for those who were afraid of it. And that's something that should be borne in mind in a situation where after so many years of financial, economic and sovereign debt crisis, there are segments of the society which really don't see a, a good future for themselves in this whole setup. But I wouldn't reduce um, the, the discussion and problems around TTIP only to the economic side of it. One striking issue which is particularly prominent in Germany, very much to the surprise of many, is that TTIP is seen as undemocratic and actually endangering national democracy. True. And what you see through that, first of all, there's a debate to be had whether that's true. But then secondly, it actually shows you that people don't trust the negotiators. They don't trust the European Commission. They think Europe, the European Commission is surrendering something that is dear to our national democracy. And that's a, that's a more fundamental problem. So is, is your message, people. cool it, just realize that there is real pushback here. There is real pushback. That, I think, has, uh, has sort of uh, come through. People know that. And that's why many people today have literally given up their hope on TTIP, right? I mean, they don't believe that this is going to go forward. But at the same time, let's look at the geostrategic consequences if this is not going to happen. Where does Europe sit uh, in, in the global markets if Europe is not going to strike further trade agreements with big regions? So I think that's the second discussion. And I feel that this dimension has lacked from the whole debate on TTIP, and it, it needs to be part of it. But the second thing is really that we haven't paid enough attention to social inequalities and to that deep set of fears that is today present in our societies in, in Europe. And it crystallizes around the issue of trade. But it's a much broader problem, and it touches on much more, on many more policy decisions that, are, that have to be taken. But the crude part, including in Germany, is that the, the more radical parties or those who are less conventional can now exploit this. Exactly. That's, that's where we have created a political context by not being alert enough of what's happening early enough, where the situation today is very complicated, but that doesn't mean we have to give up. I mean, it's late, but we can still do something. But things are moving amazingly fast. Ivan Kochok. On <coughs> the second question, whether the problem of of Zetan, which almost collapsed, was that uh, someone from the audience asked that we were not able to explain to ordinary people what are the benefits for them uh, on the basis of uh, free trade deals that we are having now in Canada in the future with, with other global partners. I think this is exactly the point, because we lost the battle, the propaganda battle, if you want, over, over the benefits and over costs of uh, uh, global trade policy that we want to influence, by the way, right at the outset. And I think this is our problem. I'm asking myself, how come that the Commission, I think, rightly has put many positive effects of global trade deals of European Union for our citizens in terms of jobs and growth? How come that instead we have been seeing 100,000 people marching on the streets in Berlin and elsewhere and, and, and the, the other camp, uh, again, populistically mobilized, has won the battle. I mean, th this is the problem where we are not able to communicate directly, can I say self-critically. We in the member states, I think, have not, have not done the job. It is impossible for the commission, uh, I can be critical with, with the commission on, on other fronts, but the commission cannot uh, uh, compete in that battle with with the representatives within the member states, unless we member states make it clear to our citizens, because this is not then credible. Daniela is right. Maybe there was a there was a problem that people were not trusting the Commission, negotiating on behalf of 500 million of people. But the Commission can never do that unless we member states participate actively, reaching out to to our people and citizens and telling them that, uh, for example, the TTIP 
uh, can produce, uh, can add to the growth and, and GDP per year 0.5%. I mean, this is non-existent argument in, in, in a public debate. Instead, it was all, you know, overshadowed by chlorinized chicken and, and, and this agenda, which is driving people on the street. I think there are problems on our side as well. Zdenek, what's your assessment of this from the banking corporate point of view? I think there is a problem of language and a problem of positioning of this. In language, there is a lot about concepts and big words and a bit of a scaremongering that will be left behind. We need to have more practical, positive examples, and there are many of what has already been done. Does anybody want to go back to national-only airlines, or is open skies good enough and flying EasyJet from London to Paris for 40 pounds? Would anybody give it up today? No. Okay, so I think we have to work between businesses and politicians to give some positive examples of what has been already achieved. And second, on the positioning, I think we are too much of the back foot as Europe. We are constantly fighting against of negativism because of globalization. What about saying that we want to lead globalization? Most of the large European companies are successful and growing because they are global. Mittelstand in Germany, many of these companies are at least regional, operating in Eastern Europe. Many of them are in Asia and everywhere. Their domestic markets are too small and not growing enough for them to be successful. I think we have to reverse the message. I've got a lot more questions coming in, and I'll open up mm. again. Um, but what I, I'd like to do is pick up, there are three or four questions there about um, the, the, the nations to the east, including Georgia, um, uh, the strengthening of partnerships, uh, and particularly common values on Russia. And the last question here, about, which was in a similar vein, about what to do about the eastern nations. I just remind you what Wolfgang Schäuble said yesterday. So we have to show we can solve problems better than any nation state alone. And as was pointed out to him, the first three of his six um, cardinal points in his main remarks were all about external borders, external affairs, and security. But in this current disillusionment with the European Union, that doesn't seem to be playing with the public. What should, what should the messages be at the moment to the, the Eastern countries, to Georgia, about, about democracy in Europe, about whether there's a good ambition to be part of the European Union, given there are these hesitant signals, there are these pushback signals as well. What's your view as coming from a former, former member of the Soviet bloc there, Matty? Right. I, I struggle uh, answering this question. Um, when in the 1990s, when, uh, when, when my country started, uh, uh, started its uh, its uh, journey back to Europe and towards the EU member uh, membership. Um, we were told, um, and rightly so, you don't really negotiate with the EU. You take what's on offer. Uh, uh, and so we did because there was there was quite a lot on offer. Uh, I I hesitate, uh, or I'm I'm embarrassed. Uh, to to uh, give the same answer to Georgians uh, right now. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are in the association agreement between the EU and, and Georgia, and especially its its trade part, there are hundreds of pieces of e of the EU legislation that the jo that Georgia would adopt, where uh, where the EU offers assistance and help. Uh, the the EU legislation, a key community, that would make Georgia a much better and much more competitive uh, nation uh, and which enables them uh, much better to benefit from the agreements that, that are there. It's, it's striking um, on all the Eastern Partnership uh, Summit declarations we have had uh, in the EU Council uh, long and tiresome uh, discussions, uh, to put it quite w diplomatically. <laughs> They're always concerned the first two or three pages uh, on the political part, whether we're going basically uh, on, on, uh, on uh, the, the political relationship and the political uh, alignment and whether whether one is a European uh, state uh, in terms of, of, the, of the Article 49 or not. And then there are 20 pages of concrete 
cooperation uh, in the field of economic communications, transport, and so on, uh, very much going on. Uh, but we, we don't debate that because, because it is so, and I understand and I support, it is so political, this, this political support, this political part. And particularly as well, the common values mentioned by Matt Breiser, um, the common values on Russia. Daniela. Uh, yeah. So we've discussed the problems within the EU for an hour, and yet the system, which we all think is in deep trouble, seems to still be very attractive to our neighbors and those countries which are already in the uh, process of negotiating membership. And I think that's a very important thing to bear in mind. So the EU still stands for something, and there are the problems we mentioned, but we need to be aware of that this is actually a huge achievement, both in terms of integration, but in terms of values we share, and in terms of wealth it has created over the decades. Now, I think the European Union has moved a lot on the way it is thinking about its neighborhood policy towards the east. Um, the big word is, of course, differentiated approaches. It, it realizes that the six countries that initially were as a package in the Eastern Partnership have gone different ways. So there are some which actually still work hard to get closer to the European Union. And I think to those three, but also to the others, the message must be, we will help you, we will support you. But at the end of the day, it's your choice and your engagement. The EU will solve no problem in any of the member states, but it can be open, it can be supportive. And this is not only speaking in financial terms and economic support, but it's also, in my view, mostly opening up to exchange on the political level, on the societal level, through education and movement. Um, your question on the message, uh, is the EU united on the message towards Russia? Well, it is still is. Germany is playing a key role of keeping Europe together on that one. Obviously, it is a challenge every time negotiations have to be conducted where the sanctions are extended and so on. And I think what we need to be very clear about is that the stance the European Union takes on Russia is not only a question towards Russia and the Eastern neighborhood, but it's also how we evaluate what Russia does within the European Union. And I think enough evidence is there to see that this is a pretty destructive approach and the, the goal is to weaken the European Union. Right. And so we need to decide whether we want to stand up against and be more vocal about it or not. Weaken the European Union, even Gosho. On Georgia and, and Ukraine, as two countries which obviously are front runners amongst the six participating member states in, in Eastern Partnership. I think a lot is at stake right now because we in the EU, we have to be, we have to be credible vis-a-vis -vis those countries. When we talk about Georgia, it's the visa liberalization and Slovak presidency is working very, very hard to get an agreement on the suspension mechanism. I will not uh, bother you with the details, but we need to deliver here and to, in order to be credible, we need to reciprocate to Georgia's progress, you know, in, in, in many areas that they have made. And Ukraine, of course, the, even more is at stake uh, when it comes to the, the Dutch referendum and, and obvious the inability to ratify and complete the ratification process because the provisional ratification obviously cannot last uh, end endlessly and, and unless there is a good progress that the DCFTA can be, can be ratified. So a lot is at stake. And why do we have to be credible? There is no other leverage on our side but to show to them that reforms pay off. I remember, I remember that from my own country where we needed the st sometimes stick of, but the leverage and the, and the perspective of uh, uh, of accession of, or getting closer to European Union for making reforms back home. I think we should recognize that these countries, for these countries it is difficult to live up to, to all the benchmarks and co conditions that we are setting for them, but unless the citizens see that once they have fulfilled the, the benchmarks, that, that we are, we are re reciprocating. Them. Given, so what happened at the Vil the given what happened at the Vilnius summit in 2013, and what was essentially in many ways, it was a a declaration of principles, an agreement of principles, but it was a miscalculation given what Russia then did. How, given that you're in the foreign ministry at the moment and you're, you, are, you are able to coordinate and see what other countries are doing, how far can this issue be pushed on principle without it leading to another significant pushback from Russia? Can you clarify that a little bit? Because well, a significant pushback by Russia. If, if, if Europe what? was to, to keep pushing uh, on these important matters of principle, 
rather like mm -hmm. what happened at the Vilnius yeah, summit. Yeah, I, I got it now. Uh, there's yes. a danger of actually it, it, it being yes, miscalculation. Because, yes, yes, because uh, we, we, we have seen it not only in these countries, but, but I think Alexander uh, is here from, from Montenegro. We have seen Russian involvement in the, in the, in the Montenegrin uh, parliamentary elections. So, of course, there is this danger. And unless we, unless we, as I say, reciprocate, there is a vacuum because in these countries there are populists as well and they can play with that and show, well, look, we are working hard, but the European Union is, is, is not responding to that. So maybe let's, let's try and find out an, another relationship. And that vacuum is attracting uh, other countries that would like to step in. I agree. All right, let's get some more questions. I hope I've almost got through everyone except how to resolve the euro crisis, which um, I might leave towards the end and I'll give, ask them for a quick trip around in the last minute or two, if I may, because otherwise we're going to get really stuck on that. Who'd like to come in with more questions, please? How many of you want to come in? The lady there and three over there. Uh, we have 20 minutes to run and there's someone at the back. I see a hand, please. I'm just a proxy for my friend here in the group. Well, who are you, though? <laughs> <laughs> Even proxies proxy. have to have a name. <laughs> oh, my name is Rinka Bralo and I run Migrants Organise in London and this is all very All right, we'll pass the microphone yes, on to your... Proxy to okay. an another right. Balkan. Sorry, <laughs> dead angle. Goran Boldiska with SETI Foundations. Can you elaborate, um, and starting from the, from the banking point, uh, what is an orderly and what is a disorderly Brexit for the capital and for the citizens of the United Kingdom and from the rest of EU 27? Thank you. You actually sent an app, you did send a question about that. I'm sorry, I was about to ask that. Do you want to answer that now quickly? Orderly and disorderly. Orderly is a clear plan and clear understanding from next year already when the negotiations start. By where March. is it going, by and large? And after the agreement has been reached, some period across businesses, not only in banking, other industries will need that too for transition. Two years is too short. It's pushing people to take decisions next year already. Are the banking community re making that representation to the British Prime Minister? Yes, we Nissan are. seemed to have achieved quite a lot in a three weeks. Many associations, including the banking groups, banking associations, are making this case. Yes. All right, please, at the back, you've got the microphone. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Tomasz Sivicek, Innovation Center of the Ustin Adlabem, uh, Czech Republic. I have a question about uh, uh, cohesion paradox, I will call it. So uh, what should be done differently to deliver more out of uh, cohesion policy, because what I see in the Czech Republic, uh, as a result for hunting the excellen excellence in uh, research and development and innovation, we have uh, regions which uh, ha are over-concentrated by innovation centers and R&D centers, and they face a huge problem of sustainability. On the other side, we have regions who has been uh, underdeveloped, and in this situation, they are even in a worse situation, so we have two problems after, after, after that. So the question is? The question is how, what to do differently that we can get more out of the cohesion policy so to avoid this cohesion paradox. So we have a cohesion policy which is doing well on average on state level or regional level, but in certain areas which are key element of competitiveness, we can see this, uh, this paradox. Thank you very much. Who's got the microphone there? All right. um, Josef Batra, uh, professor of political science at uh, Komenius University in Bratislava. Um, now, since this is brainstorming, um, my question would be, let us help out Theresa May and um, <laughs> answer that question. What exactly is Brexit? She's I mean, not here to that, <coughs> Please don't say that the UK is leaving the EU. Well, that may not be, a, well, that's not the kind of answer I'm looking for. I'm, let's conceptualize that. Let, tell me what is Brexit? What exactly is it? What's happening? Is there anyone here from the British government who can help us with it? <laughs> <laughs> even, if, if, I, even if someone was here, I think. Uh, we, the we the invitation have a went out, but they were all busy on a Saturday afternoon. Um, I'm tempted to say that's going to be a long haul. I think, can we leave that on the, that, an, an appeal from Bratislava? What is Brexit? Okay, but <laughs> as you know, that is being discussed by at least three leading um, British ministers who share the same weekend retreat. So they're their conversations might be quite interesting uh, to find out how to define that. I might ask them in a moment whether they have clarity about what Brexit is. Who's got the microphone next, please? The, to your, oh, please, yeah. 
Łukasz Pawłowski, journalist from Poland, Kultura Liberalna. To question to Daniela. You said that uh, more has to be done about what is happening in Poland and Hungary, but what specific measures do you have in mind? So, for example, on July 27, the European Commission said that the actions of Polish government were a systemic threat to the law of order and gave three months to introduce a certain corrections. This time has passed, uh, this deadline has passed on, uh, passed on, on Thursday. And what do you think is going, to ha is going to happen and what do you think should happen? Thank Remember you. Remember we're talking about the European Union and its uncertain future, but I take your point. Do you want to answer that immediately, Daniela? Yes, I will. So first of all, I think on the purely political level, the way decision makers have reacted to developments in Hungary and Poland, I was frankly disappointed because a lot more could have been done in, in actually speaking out on the issue, working through the party groups and actually making clear that things are not evolving in the way that the fundamental principles of the European Union would make people expect. Um, secondly, on that process which has been formally launched, I think the, the problem is, of course, if you go into conflict further, after not having, in that informal way, exerted pressure early enough, um, there is a huge risk of, of polarizing and going further apart. So I think that one of the reasons why we didn't see the next step is that the system itself is not quite sure what to do. Um, what I see happening at the same time, which I find crucially important, and I'm here speaking about what I see in Berlin and between Berlin and Warsaw, is that on a track 1.5 level, a discussion is being engaged to get over this confrontation which currently happens in the EU over those issues which you mentioned, and to think about how can we define a positive agenda together for the EU. And I think that's very important to engage. But um, for the system, I think the, the instruments that are in place, um, they, are not, they are not powerful enough. Do you see this as indicative of a systemic problem coming down the track, a much broader tr uh, problem? Well, let's put it that way. If, you know, if the majority within the EU shifted towards a situation where national democracies decide to no longer abide by the fundamental values the EU was created upon, we do have a huge problem. But I don't see that coming. But that makes the question so salient that we discussed earlier. What do you actually do in fighting populists and extremists within the national political systems? And here, I think we, I mean, this is the work within national democracies to a large extent, but an exchange of um, practices that have worked in some member states because we've seen countries where those parties were actually in government and then disappeared again. That's crucially important. And secondly, the EU but also national political systems need to deliver in order to avoid a situation where segments of society feel they are completely detached and hence are open to those forces. Ivan Kochok, do you want to come in here from the Visegrad point of view, from the EU 28 point of view, the EU 27 point of view? 28 maybe. <laughs> We're still 28. We're still, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're still 28. Yeah. Um, on, on that uh, rule of law and, and Poland, let us face reality. We don't have, we have legal basis right now by, by the treaty that does not allow European institutions to go and do more exactly. than they are doing right now. Poland, I can say it, is even questioning the role of the Commission, which it is engaged in right now at this moment. So we have only nuclear Article 7. However, we see that situation in some member states is subject of concern. The other question is a political, so to say, influence by political groups that can communicate with the vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the governments representing the member states from the respective groups, but that, that's something different. The, the problem right now, or reality that we are facing, is that the treaties do not allow institutions to do more than they're doing right now. Okay, right, let's get um, a couple more questions, please. I'm leaving that Brexit question hanging because otherwise I fear you will not get a clear answer. But this is a good question, by it's the way. I have no answer, but th this is, this is fundamental. No. <laughs> That's why I'm this leaving is, it hanging yeah. at the moment. Um, I could try. So, so you can work out, you can represent the British government here about what Brexit means. Um, please, who's got the microphone here? There are two others as well, please. Go ahead. Can you keep your remarks short? We've got 15 minutes to run. Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Martin Klos. I'm a member of parliament here in Slovakia. Uh, how do you see the relationship between EU and Turkey in 2017? This is quite an important question, I believe. All right, fine. Thank you. Uh, Małgorzata Bonikowska, Poland again, Center for International Relations. Just following the Brexit questions, we've heard a lot of um, opinions from the uh, uh, British politicians supporting Brexit. Uh, they were supporting Brexit, they are supporting Brexit now. 
They are telling us, use this moment. It's now or never. If you want to reform the EU, you just do it now, use this pretext. Okay. So my question would be, uh, do you see which are really these areas, these priorities, which are common to all 27 countries? Right. And second, do you think it's any possibility to go back to talks about the EU president elected in the, uh, in the elections all over Europe? Mm -hmm. Okay, please. Uh, Annalisa Piras, documentary maker. Uh, do you think that the current security threats are creating a new momentum towards progress, uh, towards a defense union, and could a shared answer of the EU countries to that question uh, provide answers to the fears of citizens and therefore help weaken the nationalism and populism? Thanks. All right, thank you. And behind you, please, Annalisa. Behind you. Stephanie Bolzen, uh, UK correspondent for the world. Um, I wonder whether at the end of the day a hard Brexit is also the best solution for the Europeans. So the UK just becomes a third country full stop because from the discussion we had yesterday you could already see if you give any um, compromise, you offer any compromise to the UK government, then the Slovak government will come and say, oh, that's actually also very interesting for us. So isn't it better to make a clear cut and uh, save time and save energy? Stephanie, thank you very much indeed. Do you mean third country or third world country? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I should be asking you, as someone based in London, do you know what Brexit is yet? Because your report... I wish, I wish that I knew, it would be a scoop. <laughs> if I knew, I had a really big scoop. But you don't... I have no idea what it is. No one right. knows what's going on there. Well, you're not on the panel, but you've answered the question. Thank you. Anyone, any, anyone else here? Quickly, one, one more question if you want it. Okay, um, let's, let's move on. This Im the important question here about how to stabilize the European Union, which goes back to things that Schäuble and the other ministers were talking about and the commissioner yesterday. Do you keep pushing forward or do you consolidate in order to get over this uncertainty um, and unpredictability? Matty. Uh, as been said by, by Wolfgang Schäuble yesterday and by several other uh, top politicians, uh, no treaty change uh, is on the table. No big integration steps are obviously uh, on the table. Um, but, there <coughs> but there are several areas where the EU can and indeed should do more. Uh, and the Bratislava Declaration captures them uh, quite well. Uh, it, it's now time to, to answer the citizens' concerns and to offer citizens uh, concrete, uh, concrete benefits and the, and the areas uh, are quite, quite clear as well as the area of security, including borders and terrorism. But there are, all, uh, there are also the areas of economic benefits uh, where much more can be done, uh, both on, on single market and uh, especially on the digital single market. Why you've got the microphone, that, that question there about security in the defense union, Schäuble talked about it yesterday. As you know, Britain is saying absolutely no way, but Britain won't be part of it. Um, but when NATO, you've got the strength of NATO, would, would a greater European representation currently, given the, what is happening in the Baltics and your fears as a Baltic state, where NATO is creating its new, quote, persistent presence, would similar troops with a different beret on or hat on make any difference? We would hardly need uh, uh, European troops in addition to, to NATO troops. But they're the same But, but what, we, uh, uh, what, what, uh, what the EU can do, uh, in fact, much better uh, than NATO, because NATO is not really equipped uh, for that, is, uh, is fighting the hybrid threats. Uh, in the fields of energy, strategic communication, trade pressure, and so on, the EU has much, uh, there's many more tools to fight. So what, that's an important clarification. So it's less about the kinetic stuff and the hard equipment. It's about something different on security and defense. That's an important nuance. Even Koshka. What, what is the question? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, we <can> do it. <laughs> firstly about, do you consolidate where you are or do you keep moving ahead on integration? I think we can, we can only stabilize and, and try and, and, and start to be a little bit more credible vis-a-vis -vis our citizens. And, and when we focus on unfinished job, 
in many areas, and there are three of them where partly the house is still burning. Migration. Can we go out on the street and uh, explain to our people that the European Union is stabilized and unless we get this under control again and there is unfinished job here? Can we make it the credible case for European monetary union unless we finish the job that we've been announcing for many years, but unfortunately we have not been making steps forward? Can we be credible unless we work on issues like energy union, which is a both, which is extremely important when it comes to competitiveness and security. So it would be, I think, impossible and at this moment to come up with big announcements, words, visions and statements and declarations, maybe in Rome, unless we really work hard uh, on this. We cannot circumvent because we, you cannot buy people uh, by nice words when they are on, on a daily basis confronted with the problem which are result of the unfinished business that I was uh, outlining. So we have, to, we have to first focus on this before we are dragged once again into um, what Madam has said uh, that our British uh, friends are telling you, more, obviously more you uh, in Poland than here in Slovakia, that now or never. It's, it's a paradox of UK referendum we tend to forget. In fact, the the, the reform steps, because Cameron has tried to sell the, the package that he got as a reformed European, European Union. The Brexit vote has put it all off the table. So UK wanted to go, go out of ever closing union. UK, in fact, uh, managed to get an agreement of the rest to introduce red card. It's all off. Then the, then the change is to free movement. It's all off. So now, I, I, if I were you, I would ask, our British uh, colleagues, what could be the content of the, of the reform which they describe now or never? That's too early to ask them, I think, at the moment. Um, but can I ask you and then Daniela? I mean, if, correct me if there are any uh, French experts here or French people, but Sarkozy appears, from what I, I, I see, to be pitching the idea of let's have the European Union as it is to keep people on side. Don't keep pushing it forward. And I may be misrepresenting what I've the leaks or whatever he's been saying in the last couple of weeks. In other words, he thinks that there's a political pitch to be made to become a candidate by saying the union is good, as, is good enough as it is. Don't rock the boat, as opposed to keeping pushing forward in the way Hollande wants to, and of course, um, Chancellor Merkel too. If, uh, it's difficult for me to interpret what, what he and for what purposes. But it's a legitimate policy position to have. I, I don't want to assess. Sarkozy, but I, I believe to, it, I, I tried to explain it in my previous uh, answer, I, I don't think we can leave it as it is without tackling really the burning problems that we have on the table. That does not mean, however, and that could be the interpretation of Sarkozy, that maybe we don't need uh, to be engaged in a major discussion and overhaul and opening uh, of, of the treaties, because if so, I think uh, we will have a problem uh, here in the European Union. Once we reopen, the, don't forget that even for minor changes, some countries of European Union need to go through referendum, and we have discussed referendum earlier. Daniela, that, that possibility that there's a strong political position for many politicians, you don't have to be elected, but uh, the idea that there's a strong position for some political uh, politicians to say, thus far, but no further on Europe to create less uncertainty? I don't think anyone at this point in time would campaign on a revision of the EU treaties, frankly, and, and not even in Germany. But that doesn't preclude that one argues for more Europe in some areas. And if you take the French position, it has become very clear that, French, uh, that France focuses on foreign security policy, but also uh, domestic security after the terrorist attacks. So I do believe that if you look at the Franco-German uh, couple, there actually is a new second topic. For years it was the Eurozone, which was sort of the, the topic that both tried to move ahead on was very difficult. But now there's a new shared item, and that is precisely this. So 
um, Sarkozy or, or not, I don't believe he will uh, define the tone that comes out of Paris in the future. But I, I do sense when I'm in Paris that there is a, an understanding that actually Europe needs to move further on a selected number of issues. And the question then is, do you need deep institutional reform for them or can you move ahead with policy initiatives? And I think, frankly, uh, very much following on what has been said about the Bratislava summit conclusions with the priority areas, uh, domestic security, external security, um, and, and social and economic issues, a lot can be done at this point without a treaty change. That's sort of for uh, a few years later down. All right, let's just put up a couple more of the questions that have uh, come in. Um, and we're right out of time, but um, I just want to pick up on the second one here. The first one, you frequently mention politicians doing a bad job. Try to name three issues you'd, you'd put in the package to make a case for the European Union. Think about that. Pessimism aside for a moment, you see the emergence of a transnational European democracy, what needs to be done to fill the EU democracy with life, emphasis on life. Um, but that question in the middle, if most of the European middle class is worse off than 20 years ago, why they, should they trust mainstream politicians who push more free deals to profit the top 1%? Ms. Denek, would you like to... Uh of review? Well, it's a difficult one. I, <coughs> I That's why don't I have the politicians time to for think. whether middle class in Europe is really so much worse off. I would argue that middle class in Europe is still living very well. I've worked in different markets but Europe, and uh, I think the living standard here is pretty high, and he, people simply have to realize that they have to work for it. The world has changed. It's 21st century. It's then competitive right there. If you want to keep what you have and get better, you have to sweat for it. I mean, I'm seeing low productivity in so many areas of European economy that I really believe that, you know, life should be a bit harder for some segments of the society. Now, leaving that aside, I think what the mainstream politicians can actually do is to sell the vision. I mean, we, from the discussion we had now, we suffer on execution. There are so many projects that need to be done. You know, in my area, the banking union, the capital markets union, you know, stabilization of Southern Europe, there is so much to be done. I don't, I'm not convinced that new initiatives is the way forward. It can be a distraction from completing what needs to be achieved. And as right. you have done it, it's a grand vision. Europe is good. European Union vision is great. And that's what the politicians need some leadership on this. We may not be able to ask, answer that question about define Brexit, and that's going to be left hanging in three minutes' time. But this issue, which is central to much of the debate, about trusting the political class, trusting the political leadership, what do you think the challenge is, uh, Daniela? Well, I, I think I made Goran's point as well earlier on. I think that's precisely it. It was neglected for too long a time that people lack perspective. And that's not only the, I don't know, 27% of youth unemployed in Spain, but it's a general phenomenon also in rich societies like the German one, that you have segments of society who feel that their future or their kids' future is not better than their own, but, but worse. But should that's politicians be saying you're going to have different jobs in future? Well, of course. Have a I mean, there's a fun skills. fundamental change going on in our yeah. economic model, so that has to be communicated early and, and really thought about. I don't think anyone has an answer yet. It's not holding back with a message, but at this point in time, there is a lack of a solution to the way work life is going to change, jobs are going to change. So there's a bigger, bigger issue here, right. again, which is not linked to Europe. Matty, um, you're a politician, so you have to consider that. Sure. But, uh, on those uh, three issues that I would put, uh, I, would, I would put four uh, uh, to, to, to the Estonian people uh, to consider whether the EU is a good thing or, or not. The seat at the table membership in, in the Eurozone, uh, the cohesion policy, and getting rid of the rooming charges. <laughs> Ivan Kochok. I uh, think for go ahead. Trust oh, in politicians. Yes, yes. The we, message from Bratislava. I, must for, I don't know whether this is a message from Bratislava. <laughs> this is my spontaneous reaction to one specific question. But I think the 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 for the politicians right now, the most important thing is to make clear to their citizens that we are subject or we are participants of a major change which is ongoing, we see it every day, and that we need to be, we need to be ready for, 
for constant adaptation that, that needs to be reflected. And that, that will be quite painful. And I believe that it's for the, for the politicians to ensure that the, the, the adaptation results in structural reforms that we are badly needing in, in European Union. Because then that is part of the answer uh, to the to the middle class, which now sees it's it's not uh, better off uh, after 20 years, because middle class here in Slovakia, after 20 years, uh, when we compare it back uh, in situation between before we joined European Union, we are better off. But the question is whether we will be better off in 10 years from now. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, in an hour and a half, we've got through an enormous number of issues. Uh, almost everything on here, except how do we solve the Euro Eurozone crisis, um, is here. That will be discussed, or may be discussed, in the next session, which is about reviving the fiscal rules framework, for those who are expert in fiscal rules. Um, thank you very much indeed to the panel, and thank you for all of you. I'm sorry I haven't got through every question, but we've done pretty well. I'd like to just repeat what we heard um, from uh, Ivan Kochok. Two things there. We need to be ready for constant adaptation for facing this uncertain future, and complacency will be expensive. Can I thank you all very much indeed? It's coffee time. Back, please, at 4 o'clock. Thank you very much.